Well, tonight it's Lincoln in 1864. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Stock. Thank you very much, Scott, for that uh, extremely generous welcome. Can everyone hear me? If my voice trails off, just raise your hand. Normally it carries, so uh, I want to know if you cannot hear me, especially in the back. It's a big, beautiful room. I actually love the girders. But call, yeah, raise your hand if you cannot uh, hear me. I'm speaking, as uh, Scott said, on Lincoln in 1864. He asked me to speak on this subject. I think it's a great way to launch the commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the fourth year of the Civil War in 1864. For most of the year, it's a very different year than 1863. Last year, around this time, uh, people, if you remember, were uh, still uh, commemorating and patting themselves on the back for Lincoln having issued the final Emancipation Proclamation, which calls for the arming of Blacks as soldiers, which opens the way for citizenship and equality under the law, because although citizenship was vague, it was understood in very vague terms at the time, the one thing that every American under recognized is that if you served as a soldier in the United States Army, you were a citizen. And that was, we can, a year ago, most Americans were thinking triumphantly. Uh, by uh, mid-year, black soldiers were, hundreds of thousands of black soldiers were helping the Union achieve victories. 1863 also, if you know anything about the Civil War, you know that the two largest, the most important battles, according to many uh, scholars, the uh, Gettysburg and Vicksburg were Union victories. In fact, there's many Southerners to this day still dream of what would have happened had Lee won Gettysburg, that the South might have been a different place. 1864 is very different, particularly for someone like Abraham Lincoln. In fact, 18, the first nine months of 1864 were the worst nine months in Lincoln's life. 1864 was the, uh, cl was the closest, and the, the Union came to losing the war. For the Confederacy, the Confederacy came this close to achieving a victory and remaining a separate country uh, with slavery intact. So what I want to do to begin is to highlight or sketch out what Lincoln and his party was up, were up against in 1864, and I'm going to be I'm going to uh, circulate uh, because images are important to it. Um, uh, Harper's Weekly. How many of you are familiar with Harper's Weekly? Harper's Weekly is essentially the precursor of Time Magazine or Life Magazine. It was the most popular. Most of that Harper's Weekly with Frank Leslie was the most widely circulated newspaper in the country. It was a visual newspaper which you'll see as I hand this out, which meant it was the first time Americans read the news visually, as the most people still do today on television uh, and with Time and Life magazine. Harper's Weekly became important for what Lincoln and other Republicans were up against. I'll show an image of this, but it gives you a sense of what uh, Northerners, how Northerners uh, receive the war. The front page is representative. It's a photograph. It's technically an engraving, but Americans understood it as a photograph of U.S. Grant in 1964. And it co coincides with the birth of visual culture, uh, meaning that tw 20 years earlier, most Americans uh, rarely saw images circulate. And this Harper's Weekly uh, and the circulation of photography had a profound impact uh, on uh, the Civil War, which I'll explain in just a second. I'll hand this out. Be careful, it's fragile. Uh, and I want to back at the end of uh, my talk. 
So the reason why 1864 was such a difficult year was really the rise of the Copperhead or Peace Democrats in the North. Copperhead or Peace Democrats constituted the greatest threat to the Union, ultimately. So first, what were they? Copperhead Peace Democrats were Northerners of the Democratic Party who wanted peace, who wanted an end to the war. A few scholars today think of Copperheads as pacifists, as thinking them, think of them as humanitarians, which is not the case. They were virulently racist. They hated abolition. They hated the Emancipation Proclamation. And there were two kinds of Copperhead or Peace Democrat Northerners. One is a group who wanted to preserve the Union as it was, meaning with slavery intact. And the second kind of group of Copperheads uh, agreed with the Confederates, which was, let's just end the war, let the Confederacy go and remain a separate country. But both of them wanted an immediate end to the war, and with the casualties, escalating consistently throughout the war, uh, beginning in 1864, it was a major, a major problem. There are three reasons why the, copperhead, the copperheads become an, a serious issue. One is simply the casualties. The Battle of Shiloh in 1862, which was like the fifth bloodiest battle, at the time, the Battle of Shiloh was the bloodiest battle in the Western Hemisphere. No one had ever imagined that the casualties could have been anything like they were. And the casualties in the Civil War in the North, the newspapers would print lists of all the casualties. So the dead, the wounded, and the missing were public news. And pages of newspapers were filled up with lists of casualties. And there's usually a town crier in a community that would just read off all the names of the people who were killed, wounded, or missing. The immediate spark of the Copperhead Democrats was the Battle of Antietam from 1862. As you know, it's the, uh, to this day, it's America's bloodiest day. So that uh, all itself is a reason for the rise of the, uh, cop the escalation of the Copperheads. But another reason is that the Battle of Antietam coincides with the first time in world history where civilians had a taste of the, what people at the time called the terrible reality of war. By which I mean the Battle of Antietam was the first time in which photographs of dead soldiers circulated by the millions to the civilians. And throughout history, well beginning with the Battle of Antietam to this day, the easiest way for a nation to lose the support of the civilian population and thus lose the war because a, a military cannot win a war. It's very difficult to win a war if you don't have civilians behind it. Is if you allow photographers to photograph dead soldiers and have them circulate. You see that in every war since uh, the Civil War. And it really begins, the power of dead soldiers through photographs begins with Antietam. And let me show you some examples. Uh, photographs of dead soldiers alter the war. Um, it's the first time, as I said, photographs of dead soldiers were disseminated to the masses. Alexander Gardner, who was running Matthew Brady's studio in Washington, D.C., arrived on the battlefield of Antietam a few days later. Alexander Gardner, who was vigorously anti-slavery himself, was obsessed almost with dead bodies. I mean, he would literally point the camera about three feet from these dead bodies. And he uh, photographed a series of uh, photographs of the dead at Antietam, is what they were called, and they were seen in his studio in Washington, D.C., in Matthew Brady's studio 
in uh, New York City, and the newspapers were shocked and amazed, and all the major newspapers wrote about these photographs. Dissemination or circulation of the photographs of Antietam, it's the first time in which people started to refer to war as the terrible reality of war. Let me read to you, I think, a brilliant understanding of the power of photography and war by the New York Times journalist who was writing on these images uh, that people saw in Gardner's uh, studio in, uh, or Matthew Brady's studio in New York. He writes, we recognize the battlefield as a reality, but it stands as a remote one. It attracts your attention, but does not enlist your sympathy. Mr. Brady has done something to bring home to us the terrible reality and earnestness of war. If he has not brought bodies and laid them in our dooryards and along the streets, he has done something very like it. Crowds of people are constantly going up the stairs. Follow them and you find them bending over photographic views of that fearful battlefield, taken immediately after the action. These pictures have a terrible distinctness. By the aid of the magnifying glass, the very features of the slain may be distinguished. And when Harper's Weekly shows the centerfold, and the centerfold, I mean, you'll see it, the magazine distributes it's huge. Can I have the next image, please? Here's one image of a row of dead bodies moving, going out into the horizon. Next image, please. And you see how accurate these engravings are, uh, are in terms of rep reproductions of the actual photographs. Can I have the next image, please? You see the bloated uh, the hands, the bloated faces. You see what war does to people. That's why I qu quoted at length the New York Times uh, journalist. Uh, can I have the next image? And this is a close-up of the engraving. Now, we might see these engravings in Harper's Weekly today as crude representations, but it's important to understand that's all they had. And this was the birth of visual culture. Americans interpreted these engravings, these photographs, what they called photographs in Harper's Weekly, in the same way that we today understand a photograph on the front page of the Wall Street Journal of the New York Times. How many of you in this room, when you see a photograph on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, believe it's truthful? Well, let me reverse it. How many of you think, how many of you think the photograph that appears on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, of the New York Times, lies and you don't trust it? Anyone? Usually in a crowd like this, there's like one or two people. <laughs> At most. This is how Americans understood these engravings. Next image, please. This is uh, 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 dead bodies in a trench in Harper's Weekly. Next image. And this is the uh, actual photograph. You see this body here. Next image. This is a close-up. If you look closely, you'll notice that this body has been decapitated. There's no way that any newspaper in the 20th century would show an image like this because of the power. Decapitated head. Next image. This is the first image in world history that censors the circulation of a dead soldier. If you notice this, this is basically a big yarn ball that covers up where the missing and from this point forward, Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War in league with Lincoln, understood the power of photographs, and they censored every subsequent photograph from circulating in the press. There was not another photograph that appears as an engraving in the Illustrated Press until after the war is over. Because in the wake of these images, coupled with Lincoln's having just passed the Preliminary Emancipation Proclamation. That's what creates an absolute explosion in the rise of Copperhead Peace Democrats. 
that which from that point forward constitute the gravest threat to the Union. Next image, please. Next image, please. This is uh, Timothy O'Sullivan of Alexander Gardner. You're probably familiar with this image. It's the field in Gettysburg where General Reynolds fell. It's a photograph. Never gets circulated. It appears in Harper's Weekly. Next image, please. As this engraving, notice the date, July 22nd, 1865. Not until after the war ends. Really, from this period through the present, not only the American State Department, but every other nation understands that if you want to win a war, you better censor the photograph. And in fact, in every subsequent war, the United States has done so. The one exception is Vietnam, in which the State Department and the military dropped their guard, so to speak. And even diplomatic historians today will acknowledge that the major reason, or one of the major reasons that the United States uh, loses, depending on your perspective, or uh, ends the war in Vietnam, is because of the iconic photographs that you're all familiar with that disseminate widely and turns the American population vigorously against the war. And at the beginning of 1864, the Copperheads are already very, very powerful. They remain powerful. So what, how does Lincoln deal with the growing power of the Copperhead Peace Party? Uh, next image, please. Uh, here's an, uh, this is from February 28, 1863, where they become uh, uh, significant even in 63. Copperheads, it's a, it's a term of uh, these uh, northerners who are like poisonous snakes slithering on the ground. Copperheads themselves reappropriate the term because the penny was also called a copperhead. They said, well, we're the true patriots. We're the true loyal Americans uh, because the reverse side of the penny had um, the image of uh, Lady Liberty on it at that time. Uh, and so in 18, the beginning of 1864, Lincoln understands how important U.S. Grant has been uh, to uh, helping win the war and preventing the Copperheads from in becoming more powerful because... He understands that the easiest way to prevent peace Democrats from rising in the North is to achieve military victories. As long as the Union Army can win battles, Lincoln is invincible, and he knows that. The, and he appoints Grant as the lieutenant general, the head of all the armies at the beginning of 1864, because Grant is the only general who actually listens to Lincoln. All the other generals had basically said, well, we want to um, take over uh, key locations, notably Richmond. And Lincoln had been telling the generals all along, I want you to chase the Confederate armies. I don't care about Richmond. I don't care about these other symbolic or uh, cities or strongholds. Grant was the only general who actually chased and went after the Confederate armies. Lincoln and Grant had a wonderful working relationship. They both understood that victory was essentially a war of attrition. The North had uh, a far greater numbers of men and resources, and they could uh, replace the dead, the missing and wounded with more troops. Grant listened to them. Grant's position as lieutenant general was the first time since George Washington where a, un where a United States general, or a North American general, had that kind of power. But immediately Grant gets stuck in the East. You're probably familiar with uh, some of uh, what happens. Um, By the eight, by the, in fact, the spring is summer, spring of 1864 goes okay. By the summer of 1864, there are absolutely unprecedented casualties. So a couple of, one statistic. Between May and July of 1864, there are 100,000 Union casualties. 
That's an unprecedented figure. And remember, these numbers are listed in the newspapers. Town crier's reading them out. It's a kind of another, you know, in the wake of, in the, in the, uh, with the censorship or the suppression of these photographs of dead, it's a kind of um, visual uh, marker or, uh, in reading out the names of the dead. Grant by mid-64 goes from being revered as, uh, in, in which most northerners refer to him as unconditional surrender grant because famously after at Vicksburg he refuses any uh, terms and uh, demands unconditional surrender and Vicksburg uh, cuts the Confederacy in two. Uh, uh, 30,000 Confederates become uh, his prisoners that in, then he releases and they're, hate, they're deeply disaffected. In my view, in fact, Vicksburg is a more important victory than, uh, than Gettysburg. But by May, June of 1864, he's now referred to as Grant the Butcher because of all the men he has lost. Lincoln loved Grant. We now love Grant today, but if you're a soldier, soldiers hated fighting for Grant because they knew that Grant was willing to lose men. They knew that Grant was willing to lose men. He increasingly became referred to as the butcher. Next image, please. Here's Grant on the cover of Harper's Week. It's this actual magazine I'm dis disseminating or circulating. You see how accurate the photograph is with the engraving? When many northerners, especially Copperheads, see this image in 1864, a number of people said, that Grant, is, he's, he looks insane. They imagine him as bashing his head against the tree. <laughs> That's the kind of guy he was. Copperheads, to, to give you an ex, a sense of how powerful the Copperheads were, General Lee described the Copperheads as the greatest ally of the Confederacy. In a letter to Jefferson Davis, Lee says, the most effective way of weakening the enemy is to give all the encouragement we can to the rising peace party of the North. Copperheads uh, are, receive money from the Confederacy. They're literally closely allied with the Confederacy. Confederates give them money for their newspapers. Uh, they're in league and in many communities, especially in the Midwest. Uh, they hope to overthrow the local governments. And at one point in 1864, Copperheads who have met with Confederate intelligence in Canada have this scheme of uh, basically taking over the states of Illinois and Indiana and Ohio and having them move to the south to help the uh, Confederacy in this, uh, this uh, um, uh, almost uh, intelligence or espionage, subversive um, form. Nothing ever becomes of it, but it truly was uh, profoundly um, powerful. An example of how uh, the northern spirits had declined is that Cold Harbor, among the soldiers, called the Battle of Cold Harbor in June, in which Grant is ensconced in this wilderness that he is planning a charge, a major charge. And the next day, or I'm sorry, the night before the charge, most of Grant's, or many, if not most of Grant's men, became so despondent that they wrote the equivalent of a suicide note or a death letter. They wrote their last letters, and they pinned their names to their jackets, assuming that they would die the next day in the charge. So this piece that's uh, recovered after the Battle of Cold Harbor by one soldier, it reads, June 3rd, Cold Harbor, I was killed, found on his body in the wake. That gives you a sense of the despondence that, uh, that uh, so many northern soldiers feel. What this means for Lincoln in mid-1864 is that he becomes certain that he will lose the re-election. Remember, 1864 is the re-election year. Radical Republicans, the radical abolitionists, become frustrated with Lincoln. 
because he's not being more vigorous at working toward achieving not only emancipation, which, we ha which he has, but re equality before the law. Lincoln pocket vetoes the Wade Davis bill, which uh, is a, a bill that Congress passes, which requires all Southerners uh, to take a, an oath saying that they had never supported the Confederacy before they could return to the United States as citizens. And if they didn't take that oath, they were disfranchised, which opens the way for citizenship and equality before the law for blacks in the South. And Lincoln thought that was too severe to the former Southern states. Lincoln's vision of Reconstruction is just after the war's over, let these Confederates just come back into the Union. We won't uh, punish them. Com most uh, generally, general amnesty. And the radical, radical abolitionists and Republicans understood the danger that these Confederates posed to their vision, their goal, not only of emancipation, but uh, biracial democracy of equality before the law. They. Uh, uh, they nominated their candidate, John C. Fremont, who had been the presidential candidate of 1856. So even within Lincoln's own party, his party splits. John C. Fremont is a, is a fringe that splits off from Lincoln, and Fremont becomes a, uh, a kind of a radical uh, or progressive Republican candidate. Lincoln uh, feels certain, as I said, he's going to win all of his major lieutenants also believe that Lincoln is going to lose the election. Thurlow Weed is probably the most powerful Republican politico. Says in mid-1864 that Lincoln's chances of re-election are nil. Henry Raymond, who is the head of the Republican Party, tells Lincoln in, mid, in the summer of 1864, if the election were today, you'd lose in a landslide. Lincoln tells his own cabinet that he's going to lose the election of 1864. And the only thing people say that Lincoln could do to increase his chances were to repudiate his Emancipation Proclamation and his Emancipation as a vision and offer to negotiate with the Confederacy, and he and everyone else knew that the Confederacy would only negotiate if slavery was on the table. South secedes because of slavery, and unless they can keep their slaves, they're not going to negotiate. And so, from a matter of principle, from a matter of morality, Lincoln's greatest crisis, greatest moral crisis, occurs in 1864. He's so despondent that by August of 1864, wondering what he can do to turn the tide and help him get reelected, because by August he also understands that if the Democrats win the election, George McClellan, as you probably know, is the Democratic candidate, if the Democrats win the election, that's a victory for the Confederacy. It's something that a lot of people don't appreciate. And the, the Democrats are a shoe-in for the presidency in, in midsummer in June, July, and August of 1864. McClellan runs on a peace platform. If I win, we'll have as soon as possible a peace negotiated settlement which would almost certainly leave the Confederacy intact, and essentially a victory for the Confederacy. And in August of 1864, Lincoln said, well, what can I do? I, I am not going to repudiate my emancipationist policy. Part of it is for reasons of, uh, of prag pragmatism. He says, I, there are almost 200,000 black soldiers who have been crucial to Union victories crucial for any hope of us winning the war. If I reverse or repudiate my policy of emancipation, what do you think those black soldiers are going to do? You think they're still going to be willing to fight and die for the Union? No way. In early, 1860, or early August of 1864, Lincoln sends a telegraph 
to his close, well, his friend, Frederick Douglass, who at the time was the most popular and powerful African American in the United States. In fact, uh, my book, Douglass on the Giants, The Parallel Lives of Douglass and uh, Lincoln, I point out, highlight the parallel nature of their lives. Douglass was more famous than Lincoln in the United States until 1860. He was a household name. He was widely understood as the le African American leader. The first meeting had been in August of 1863, after the Emancipation Proclamation, Douglas uh, devoted full time to recruiting. In fact, Douglas virtually almost single-handedly fills the ranks of the Massachusetts 54th, the first northern black regiment. And he, in 1863, has his first meeting with Lincoln because at that time, Union, uh, the, the United States was paying black soldiers half of what white soldiers were being paid, and they, not, they were not promoted. Douglas had been very frustrated with Lincoln. In fact, it's safe to say Douglas hated Lincoln until Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and his attitude changes irrevocably. And, but with soldiers, black soldiers being paid half of what white soldiers are paid, he takes his tape, goes to Washington, D.C., hoping to have a meeting. They have their first meeting in August of 1863. They have an hour-long meeting. They publicly declare themselves as friends in the wake of this meeting. And this was a time in which friendship meant a lot more than it does today. Friendship connoted that two people were equals. Friendship today has become a commodity. I'm a friend of Facebook. I'm a friend of the Metropolitan Museum of Art or the Delaware Historical Society because I give them money. <laughs> friendship is a form of commodity today. 19th century, friendship had immense, deep, spiritual, cultural, uh, emotional uh, connotations, one of which was that it was two men are equal. In that first meeting of 63, Frederick Douglass was the first black man to meet with and advise a U.S. president. The second meeting was when uh, this meeting is now Lincoln asking him to come, saying, I need you. And the second visit was an all-expense-paid trip. There's a presidential carriage waiting to pick Douglas up at, uh, to take him to the White House. And when he sees Lincoln, Lincoln says, I, I'm going to lose the election. And I think you can help me. And Lincoln says, what I would like you to do is embark upon a John Brown scheme. In other words, I want you to take a, hundred, a couple hundred hand-picked men, mostly blacks, and it's a, uh, invade the South as a, a, uh, a part of an uh, uh, intelligence. Invade the South, and the goal is to bring as many slaves, technically freedmen, into Union lines as possible. Best case scenario, tens, even hundreds of thousands of blacks will be brought to Union lines, form regiments, help us achieve a major military victory that will turn the tide of northern opinion. Because remember, Lincoln and everyone else knew that the way to check the rise of the Peace Democrats is to achieve military victories, and the easiest way to achieve military victories is Lincoln and Douglas and other people knew was to arm more black regiments. And Lincoln says, worst case scenario, I lose the election, the Confederacy is victorious. Slavery remains intact. But tens, perhaps tens of thousands or more blacks will be brought to Union lines and thus to freedom. Because if the Confederacy wins, Emancipation Proclamation is null and void. And Douglas said, I never understood the degree to which Lincoln hated slavery as at that moment. And this second meeting in 1864, which was Lincoln's, in a sense, his last ditch effort in August to try to recoup, to reverse what he feels is going to be a certain loss, that meeting highlights the social revolution that had occurred in the United States. Because if you know anything about John Brown, you know that John Brown is, well, most of you probably think of John Brown as this kind of madman and lunatic. 
He's the militant abolitionist who, with a small army of blacks and whites, invade the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry in 1859, hoping to distribute arms to slaves and spark a massive slave insurrection. He's captured, he's hanged for treason and murder, and he becomes the major catalyst that sparks or ignites uh, Southerners to secede. Because most Northerners are uh, anti-slavery by this point, and because of people like Emerson and Thoreau and Frederick Douglass, they are sympathetic to John Brown, even though they recognize him as maybe a little bit mad and certainly treasonous. So when Brown first re as, is executed, Lincoln says that John Brown was justly hanged. He committed treason. And he also said he's a bit of a madman. He said, yeah, I sympathize with his principled opposition to slavery, but the guy's a loony. Now, in 1864, in his meeting with Douglas, he's saying, I want you to embark upon a John Brown scheme. John Brown, in 1864 has been mainstreamed. He is now the Union mascot. In fact, the most popular song in the Union Army is John Brown's body. John Brown's body lies moldering in the grave. His soul is marching on. And that's an unambiguous abolitionist hymn. He's gone to be a soldier in the army of the Lord. His soul is marching on. We'll hang Jeff Davis on the sour apple tree. Unambiguous. So Douglas goes back home to Rochester and he creates, it's actually like the precursor of the special forces of Green Britain. He, write, he creates this 20 page outline, seriously, 20 page outline, articulating his incursion into the South in which he'll uh, bring back as many blacks as possible in the South into Union lines. He sends the proposal, the outline to Lincoln, who likes it a lot, and then Thankfully, in my view, uh, Sherman, who had been at a siege, uh, had, had dug himself in at a siege in Atlanta, finally takes Atlanta in early September. And Sherman's uh, victory at Atlanta and then his march to the sea, that's what ultimately and finally silences uh, the peace or Copperhead Democrats, dramatically turns the tide of public opinion and enables Lincoln to get reelected. That's the only thing. And the timing, I mean, think about the timing. Lincoln had a month and a half to spare. And Sherman had been doing everything he could to take Atlanta for six months. It highlights how close the United States came in 1864 to losing the war. The third, the Douglas then meets, um, well, actually at that meeting, as I said, Douglas said, I never understood the degree to which Lincoln hated slavery as at that moment. And their third meeting was when Lincoln, or when Douglas uh, had a front row seat at the second uh, inaugural. Lincoln saw Douglas in the crowd, uh, and the, his uh his, when Lincoln, uh, his re-election platform was a platform of passing the 13th Amendment, uh, amendment that, uh, that ends slavery everywhere. And to kind of capture the, I think, symbolic importance of Douglas's and Lincoln's relationship at the third meeting, Douglas attends this reception at the White House when he enters, he sees Lincoln surrounded by hundreds of whites. Lincoln sees Douglas and he raises his long arm and says, Here comes my friend Frederick Douglas. I saw you in the crowd today. What did you think of my second inaugural? There is no man in these United States whose opinion I value more than yours. And Douglas said, Mr. Lincoln, that was a sacred effort. The next time that a black man met with and advised the U.S. president on terms of equality in the way that Douglas and Lincoln did is when Martin Luther King Jr. met with and advised Lyndon Johnson nine times in the 1960s. It gives you a sense of how profoundly 
revolutionary this meeting was that, that reflects the social revolution that the Civil War brings about. In 1860, when Lincoln is elected, his vision of democracy was still a white man's democracy. Lincoln, like 95% of other anti-slavery Northerners, were, were, believed that slavery was evil, but felt that it should be abolished very slowly over a long period of time, and that blacks should not be citizens, and in fact, should, he, would, he encouraged colonization or deportation of blacks. So from, from the vast majority, even of progressive Northerners in 1860, of imagining democracy as solely a white man's democracy, to 64, where now Lincoln, like Douglas, is starting to envision a biracial democracy, that is a social revolution. Now, before I summarize the lessons, Scott asked me to uh, say a bit about... Um, because I'm in Delaware. What about Delaware? Congress and President Lincoln in a state of war can employ war measures to preserve the Union against the enemy. Border states are not the enemy. Border states are the friends. So the Emancipation Proclamation does not apply constitutionally to the slaves in Delaware, Maryland, uh, in Kentucky. So Lincoln basically holds out a carrot and offers compensated ma emancipation to these border states, offers federal money to the states if they emancipate their slaves. Now, Delaware was actually unique in the border states. First, Delaware was the only border state that did not have a vigorous uh, secessionist uh, 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 group. Um, Lincoln's and uh, Edwin Stanton had to silence and imprison secessionists in Maryland and Kentucky to prevent those states from seceding. In fact, Maryland probably would have seceded had he not arrested and thrown in jail a bunch of Marylanders uh, planning a secessionist convention. There was no uh, significant secessionist uh, group in Delaware. And so from that perspective, Lincoln doesn't have to worry about Delaware seceding the way he does Maryland and Kentucky. Because particularly if Maryland secedes, it's all over. Washington is surrounded. And yet the slave owners in Delaware, there weren't that many slave owners. The statistics are in Delaware that there were only 1,800 slaves, but by 1864 there were 900 black soldiers from Delaware fighting for the Union which is, a, I mean, a huge number given the small percentage of African Americans in Delaware. But the slave owners in Delaware were staunchly pro-slavery. They weren't taking Lincoln's bait. And the Delaware, Delaware legislature uh, refused to pass a, an emancipation, uh, uh, a gradual emancipation bill until very, very way into the war. And in fact, Delaware finally emancipates its slave in the very day in December of 1865 in which the 13th Amendment has finally been ratified. And Lincoln understands, he's early on, he's pressuring or basically holding on to count for the Board of States to secede because early on he's envisioning not only an Emancipation Proclamation that couples Congress, which is way ahead of Lincoln in turning the war into an Emancipation War, but Lincoln and Congress both know is that Emancipation Proclamation does nothing after the war is over. We need a, um, a uh, constitutional amendment. And the way, and the constitutional amendment, as you know, three quarters of the states need to support it. I need these border states supporting an amendment that ends slavery forever. So that's why he's pressuring these border states. He needs Kentucky, he needs Maryland, he needs Delaware. And, Del and uh, so it's one of the reasons why Delaware uh, is the, finally the, you know, the, last, uh, the last border state to, um, to free its slaves. So what do we learn from the ordeal 
of uh, 1864, of Lincoln in 1864. There are a number of things that I'll just end with. One is victory for the Union, as I've suggested, hinged on controlling what Lincoln called the fire in the rear. The greatest threat to the United States was the Copperhead or Peace Party of the North. It's our own neighbors and friends, not, the, not so much the Confederacy. And it led Lincoln and Stanton and the, his administration to silence dissenters, to censor the press in order for civilians to support the war effort. Since uh, Lincoln was assassinated, still to this day, many people are very critical of Lincoln because he vigorously suppressed freedom of speech, censored uh, copperheads. In my view, he had every right to. Copperheads were treasonous. They were receiving money from the Confederacy, as I pointed out in Lee's quote. They were the greatest allies of the Confederacy. So he silences them, he arrests them, he suspends habeas corpus, habeas corpus. He should have. Because too few people under, appreciate the power in, of uh, the Copperheads. Second is the relationship between Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. And the Emancipation Proclamation itself and the 13th Amendment, the social revolution that comes about, reflected a pragmatic understanding of the war. Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln, their friendship was a utilitarian friendship, which reflects how the social revolution comes about. What do I mean by that? Lincoln as commander-in-chief and as president, understood and was very forthright about this, said that my chief aim is always simply to win the war and preserve the Union. He famously said in a letter to Horace Greeley, if I can win the war and preserve the Union by keeping slavery, I will. If I can win the war and preserve the Union by ending slavery, I will. The social revolution, his friendship with Douglas reflected the fact that Lincoln came to understand that the only way he could win the war and preserve the Union is if he emancipated slaves and armed blacks. As Frederick Douglass says, beginning right after, uh, right after uh, Fort Sumner, is that the slaves in the South, blacks in the South, constitute a potent source of power, essentially black power. With them, we will win the war. And from Douglas's perspective, from abolitionist perspective, in order to emancipate slaves, to achieve universal freedom and racial equality, you have to win the war. If the Confederacy wins, slavery still is intact. So these two discrete aims had converged into one. And that's crucial to understand. Lincoln, as well as every other northerner, understood the importance, the military strategic importance of black soldiers. He said, right around the time he met with Frederick Douglass publicly, we cannot spare the 100 or 140 or 150,000 blacks now serving us as soldiers, seamen, and laborers. This is not a question of sentiment or taste, but one of physical force. Keep it and you can save the Union, throw it away, and the Union goes with it. The third lesson is that I think one of, the, uh, one of the reasons why Lincoln is, in my view, the America's greatest president, and in this he shared with Douglas, is that he understood that political differences did not correlate uh, with interpersonal behavior. By which he meant, uh, by which I mean, that Lincoln was very close friends Douglas with conservatives, with people whose political views were just like himself. Lincoln was eager to discuss, to debate, to compromise, to collaborate and work with people of all different political and ideological persuasions. And so was Frederick Douglass. So were abolitionists in general. And in our incredibly divisive political environment today, that's something that's easily forgotten. I mean, for to today, how many 
you know, diehard Republicans say, I'm a close friend of a liberal Democrat. Unfortunately, not that many. But that's a symbol of democracy. Democracy is about people having very passionately held different beliefs, still able to befriend each other, to work together, to like each other, to enjoy their company. That's what democracy is. It's not about everyone agreeing or having the same political and ideological views. The fourth lesson is simply Lincoln's amazing principled uh, sensibility. Most other presidents would have crumbled in the stress that Lincoln was under and been willing to negotiate with the Confederacy and put slavery on the table, uh, which would have meant repudiating uh, emancipation. And the final lesson uh, is that it's reflected in the images of death I showed. It's reflected in the soldiers at Cold Harbor. And that is, ironically, uh, right around this time, it highlights the degree to which the Civil War, which in many respects is such a, uh, a part of a heroic age, it constitutes the end of the heroic age. What do I mean by heroic age? The Civil War, the beginning of the Civil War, is a period in which Americans, individuals, believed that they themselves could help to institute social change. Soldiers, most soldiers north and south at the beginning of the war, believed that with faith in God, with my Bible, and with courage, I will not only survive, but will vanquish the enemy. That captures a sense of the power of individuals in affecting social change. It fuels the um, temperance movement, the abolition movement, the desire for reform. And both Douglas and Lincoln in very different ways were reformers. So were copperheads. They wanted to reform. They wanted to uh, reform the nation back to where it had been. But it was a heroic age means an age in which people have faith in individuals as a crucial catalyst for social change. In the example I gave of Cold Harbor, where soldiers the night before the march write their suicide note and pin it on their uniform saying, I'm going to die tomorrow, highlights the degree to which a kind of fatalism has set in. A degree to which they feel, I'm a pinball ricocheting off the forces of society. As an individual, I have little, virtually no impact in my ability to change society. And that ultimately was one of the greatest effects of the Civil War, uh, is this loss of faith in individuals in their capacity uh, to change society. Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln were, in my view, the two preeminent self-made men in American history. They understood self-making not as rising up to get rich, whether it's by circumstances, but it was reflected the idea that as an individual, as I evolve, I can help to affect change in my world and in my community. As Douglass said in one of his famous speeches, the true self-made man and woman is someone who seeks to eradicate the sins of his or her society. That's what self-making is. Today it's understood as rising up to get rich. So the lessons of uh, 1864 and Lincoln in 1864, hopefully, although um, gruesome, uh, will be inspiring, particularly the principled nature, uh, the... Um, image of the symbol of biracial democracy. Lincoln has inspired millions of Americans. Uh, Douglas has inspired millions of Americans. Hopefully Lincoln, as you think about Lincoln in 1864, you will be inspired uh, to fulfill finally, uh, the, uh, to bind up the nation's wounds, as Lincoln said, and to fulfill finally the ideals of freedom and equality of opportunity for all Americans. Thank you.